Most people think that supplements are harmless, just natural little boosters to your health. But here's the truth, some supplements can actually be harmful for your health. Or at least you should think twice before taking them. So in this video I'm gonna go through these supplements. Number 1 BCAAs. When I started to go to the gym more seriously around 12 years ago, the first supplement I ever took was branched chain amino acids or BCAAs. Why? Because they're marketed as amino acids that help you build more muscle. You take them in between meals when you're not eating to avoid muscle breakdown. The irony is that taking BCAAs alone can actually result in greater muscle breakdown. That's because BCAAs only contain three of the essential amino acids, leucine, isoleucine and valine. You need all nine of the essential amino acids to stimulate protein synthesis, and the three BCAAs fall short of that. Ingesting BCAAs alone has been seen to result in decreased muscle protein synthesis through reduced essential amino acid concentrations. The body gets the signal to increase protein synthesis from leucine, but because it doesn't have the other eight building blocks, it catabolizes its own tissue to get them. So if you were to take BCAAs on an empty stomach without eating anything, you're probably going to break down more muscle than you're going to build. And if you take BCAAs with a meal or with a protein shake or something like that, then you're getting all the nine essential amino acids from the food that you're eating. So in that case, BCAAs are a waste of money. Clinical trials show that BCA supplementation has no effect on muscle growth or exercise performance. The most consistent benefit is the reduction in muscle soreness and creatine kinase after resistance exercise. BCAs also reduce the amount of tryptophan entering the brain because they compete with tryptophan uptake. This prevents the production of serotonin, the neurotransmitter of calmness. There's also a correlation between higher circulating BCA levels and insulin resistance, obesity, diabetes and heart disease. Individuals with the highest BCA concentrations have a 2-5 to five fold higher risk of developing diabetes. Now, I don't think that it's necessarily causal that higher BCA amounts would cause diabetes. It's just that during insulin resistance, you have abnormally high levels of BCAs in the blood. However, clinical trials have shown that reducing BCA intake improves glucose tolerance, body composition and insulin sensitivity in humans and mice. So in the best case scenario, BCAs are just a waste of money. But in the worst case scenario, BCAs make you lose more muscle tissue if you take them in a faster state and they might increase your risk of diabetes. Although I think that risk would only apply to people who already have metabolic disease or insulin resistance, not healthy people. Number two is iron. Iron is an essential mineral and iron deficiency anemia is the most common nutrient deficiency in the world. Unfortunately, too much iron promotes atherosclerosis and heart disease because iron is easily oxidized. And if you have too high iron levels in the blood, it begins damaging the blood vessels. High iron levels in the blood haven't seen to be associated with a higher risk of heart disease and more vulnerable plaque in the arteries, which is the worst kind of plaque. There aren't any studies specifically looking at the effects of iron supplementation on heart disease risk or atherosclerosis because, you know, it would be unethical to do that kind of a study. But the evidence around high iron status and increased risk of heart disease is quite consistent. The only people who would benefit from iron supplementation are people who have iron deficiency or heart failure. However, even a 2021 meta-analysis of 10 studies saw that oral and intravenous iron supplementation didn't reduce mortality in iron-deficient heart failure patients. So it all depends on your iron status. Normal iron levels are 70 to 175 micrograms per deciliter for adult males and 50 to 170 micrograms per deciliter for adult females. Iron status higher or lower than that appears to be associated with increased risk. Number three, calcium. Calcium supplements have been seen to increase the risk of heart disease by raising blood calcium levels too high, which causes hypercalcemia. This results in more calcium being stored in the arteries, leading to the progression of atherosclerosis. This 10-year follow-up study on older adults saw that dietary calcium wasn't associated with increased coronary artery calcification, whereas calcium supplementation was associated with a 22% higher risk. Calcium supplements also increase the risk of arrhythmias, or irregular heartbeat. So it's the calcium supplements specifically that appear to be harmful, especially in larger doses over 1000 milligrams per day. People who might be fine with taking calcium are people who one, have low calcium intake from diet, they usually don't eat dairy or enough leafy greens, or two, they have low calcium levels in the blood. So for them, the calcium supplement won't cause hypercalcemia. The biggest risk comes from people who are eating a lot of calcium, they're supplementing a lot of calcium, and they have high calcium levels in the blood. Diabetes also appears to increase the risk, as this 2023 study saw calcium supplementation being associated with heart disease events in people with diabetes. Calcium supplements are often recommended for postmenopausal women to reduce their risk of hip fractures. 
However, even postmenopausal women might see increased risk of heart disease from calcium supplements. A 2021 meta-analysis of 13 randomized controlled trials saw that calcium supplementation at a dose of 1,000 mg a day increased the risk of heart disease by 15% in healthy postmenopausal women. So calcium supplements might not be the best option even for postmenopausal women. For this, something like calcium alpha-ketoglutarate might be a more suitable option because number one, it's lower in calcium, so you're getting a safe amount of calcium. Two, calcium AKG supplementation has been seen to increase bone density in postmenopausal women. Whenever you're taking calcium or vitamin D for that matter, then you should combine it with vitamin K2 and magnesium to reduce the calcification. Number four, resveratrol. Resveratrol is thought to be a longevity supplement, but the evidence from animal studies is very mixed and the general consensus right now is that it's not a longevity supplement. In the interventions testing program, resveratrol didn't extend lifespan of genetically heterogeneous mice, which tends to support the idea that resveratrol isn't a longevity supplement. Even GlaxoSmithKline, that paid $720 million for resveratrol, shut down the resveratrol and sirtuin program in 2013. They stopped trying to turn resveratrol into a product, probably because they saw the writing on the wall. The only condition under which resveratrol extends lifespan is obesity and metabolic disease, as shown by a 2006 study where mice were fed an insanely fattening diet. Interestingly, resveratrol does appear to improve inflammation and metabolic markers in humans with diabetes and obesity as shown by several human clinical trials. The reason you want to think twice about taking resveratrol is that it blunts the positive effects of exercise on cardiovascular health in humans. Exercise improves lipids and metabolic markers, but resveratrol appears to ameliorate those effects. Resveratrol also lowers DHEA levels, but it doesn't affect testosterone and DHT. DHEA is a precursor to testosterone, so it might be an insignificant effect. So unless you are obese and you have diabetes, you don't really have anything to gain from resveratrol. Another resveratrol cousin molecule is called pterostilbene, and this molecule has no evidence for life extension either. There's actually very little human research about pterostilbene, and the research we do have suggests it actually increases LDL cholesterol. Number five, metformin. Now, metformin isn't a supplement, it's a diabetes drug, but I think it's worthwhile to mention it because a lot of people are recreationally taking metformin for the sake of longevity. The evidence for metformin's longevity effects are also quite conflicting, even in animal research and it doesn't appear to have longevity benefits for non-diabetic humans either. Because of that, it's important to be aware of the potential risks and side effects of metformin. Metformin has been seen to reduce VO2 max and inhibit the mitochondrial adaptations to aerobic exercise. Exercise increases whole body insulin sensitivity and VO2 max, but metformin blunts that, meaning that you get lower VO2 max gains than if you were to not take metformin. Metformin has been seen to reduce testosterone levels and counteract the increased testosterone you see from better blood sugar levels, not only in men, but also women. I'm not saying that metformin is the worst medication out there, but it is a net negative for an otherwise healthy individual. Instead of metformin, there is another class of diabetes drugs called SGLD2 inhibitors that have been seen to extend lifespan in mice, they also lower blood sugar and improve kidney function, and they are also seen to reduce the risk of mortality in humans. They do that without lowering testosterone and by even increasing VO2. SGLD2 inhibitors, they have side effects, the biggest one being an increased risk of genital fungal infections, but they have fewer side effects overall than metformin. Finally, we have antioxidant supplements like vitamin E and vitamin A. A 2021 Cochrane review of clinical trials saw that vitamin E, vitamin A and beta carotene were possibly associated with increased mortality risk, whereas vitamin C and selenium were not. I think this is something you don't really have to worry that much about because these studies find an extremely small increased risk, something like 1 to 3%. It's not something to ignore completely, but because it's very difficult to measure things like all cause mortality, the effects can be because of something else. So I wouldn't really worry about taking vitamin E or vitamin A. I don't really think anyone really needs vitamin A or vitamin E supplementation to begin with. Interestingly, you don't see increased mortality risk from things like NAC, azaxanthin, melatonin, or other antioxidant supplements. However, taking antioxidants like NAC at the wrong time might blunt the benefits of exercise such as muscle hypertrophy. So just don't take antioxidants after exercise. And don't take too many antioxidants for no reason. As you can see, some supplements are better than others. I think you should try to avoid supplements that don't have any proven benefits, they're kind of speculative, and they have documented side effects that can even damage your health. I ranked 100 of the most popular supplements out there from worst to best. Check out my video about that next.